So hello, hello everybody. Um, welcome to our talk. It's nice to be at Suricon again. Um, this is me, Sascha Steinbiss and Matthias Valentin uh, talking about security content and how it can help us detect threats across past, present and future. So before we start, probably just a quick word about the two of us. Um, my name is Sascha. Um, I, my background is in fact in uh, computational biology and bioinformatics, but uh, for the last five years I've been working at DCSO, a German managed security service provider as a senior software engineer, working on their threat detection hunting service, um, as well as working on Suricat itself and also on Debian. Yeah, and hi, I'm Matthias, founder and CEO at Tensier. Prior to that, I spent almost a decade with the Zeek team at Berkeley while I was doing my PhD. And I focused on high performance network monitoring. And nowadays at Tensier, what excites me is building tools for threat detection in SOC environments. Thank you, Matthias. Um, okay, so we'll be talking about some terms a lot in our talk. So let's just um, do some definitions at the very beginning so we know what we're talking about. So, um, Security content. So what do we mean by that? Uh, we're talking about rules, like Suricata rules um, that we all know and love, um, IOCs, so atomic indicators, URLs, domains, and so on. And you could also think uh, of security content as scripts or some kinds of code that you run to do detection on whatever data you observe. Um, we're not going to concentrate on the last part that much. We will mostly be talking about Suricata rules and technical indicators, atomic indicators. So how do we usually use those um, for detection? Suricata rules, basically no brainer. They can just be loaded into Suricata. Uh, they will be running there and uh, can also just be shared in files. So that's that's very easy to, to work with those. With indicators, there are different ways to actually use them. They could be wrapped in rules. So you could have a rule that just matches a buffer against those. Um, they could be part of data sets, so big containers of potentially millions of uh, indicators that we can match up uh, against in rules. Or they could be matched downstream. So they could be an additional tool that um, processes through cutter output and matches at that part. Um, code could be um, Lua scripts that are bundled with, uh, with Suricata rules. Zeek has a similar thing. But these are usually quite heavyweight and not that easy to share because you don't only have the, the rule file, there's also the scripts that need to be distributed with it. So there's usually a bundle of things that you need to pass around. On the right-hand side, there's just a couple of examples. The first one's a rule that just matches um, on some SMB traffic. Um, the second one embeds uh, evil.com as a domain matching on a DNS buffer somewhere. And the last one on the right-hand side um, references a data set that just contains that and we match on everything that is in this data set. So let's just describe typical deployment situations. This is the easiest one that we can think of, right? This most simple one. This is basically what you would get if it would just uh, install Suricata from your distributions package. It just re it requires Suricata itself, a NIC that delivers packets to Suricata, and um, a set of security content, uh, like a set of Suricata rules or data sets. And maybe this just writes uh, the alerts or the metadata somewhere to a local file. So that is, this is the most basic thing you can get. Um, if you want to do any additional matching, you might want to send all the data Suricata generates to an additional engine that, for example, can match Sigma rules, scripts, or IOCs downstream against the data that we get. Um, this could be something like Fever or Mir or, or Sagan or things like that. In the course of this talk, we will focus on Fever, which is uh, DCSO's um, tool to do exactly that. So, Let's just assume we're consuming uh, if JSON from Suricata, process it in Fever, and then send it on to syslog-ng for further um, processing. Let's, now let's assume that there's also some kind of HQ that um, a centralized part, um, centralized location to process uh, information from a potentially distributed sensor fleet. Um, and you also want to have some kind of context engine that does additional processing, right? Enrichment, filtering, um, to send everything off afterwards to a CM, could be Splunk, could be an Elk stack, something like that. And this is probably a situation that's not new to many here in the audience, right? Um, so this is, this is basically a setup that we will be coming back to in the course of this talk, um, describing improvements to that situation. So um, what ways do we have to obtain security content? For rules, 
we have Zulkata Update, which is a very nice tool to pull these from a source that's defined somewhere. And then afterwards, we need to reload uh, the rules inside Zulkata, for example, via the command control socket. This can be done while Zulkata is running. For datasets, it's not that easy yet. There's no tool to handle datasets. Probably you have, you have to download them separately or manually um, from some, some site. Um, and then um, I think you have to actually have to restart the recut itself because there's no way to, to reload a dataset once it's defined. For downstream matching, basically all bets are off. For, for Bloom filters, like the ones that we use in Fever to do downstream matching, we have to update them manually via curl or any other HTTP fetching tool and then reload them within Fever. Um, via command line or gRPC. That can also be done while Fever is running. And for Sigma rules, it's basically dependent on how the, the CM does things. So um, rule updating is basically the only thing that the default tooling allows, right? So that's, uh, that's the first thing in a set of challenges that we need to talk about, how to improve things here in this section. Um, so rule updating is fine. We can say that that is a solved problem, at least um, in in some regards. But for data set, there's not really there's not really an, a best practice on how to do that. Um, and everything that's beyond rules uh, needs to happen downstream, and everyone has to build their own their own solution to do it. Um, another question is how to make these this download of security content more, more efficient, right? So let's imagine we have a sensor that observes a lot of traffic, but it only has a very low bandwidth connection uh, to, this, to the uh, location it gets the content from. So that might become a problem, right? And also connected to that is the question of granularity. Do we want to always um, uh, transmit a multi-megabyte set of uh, security content if there's just one new IOC? Is that really the level of granul granularity we want to work at? And there's also a choice to be made on when to construct new con security content and when to send it to, towards the sensor, right? So if, for example, we update the security content just once each day, there's always some kind of delay that, that we need to wait at minimum until a rule or any other kind of security content that we have can be active on the sensor. And there's potentially multiple steps involved, um, which, each of which can break at some point. Um, and all in all, there's always a, tri a trade off between um, the time to detection and the overhead of rule reload. We could send a new rule set each minute uh, and we would be very quick to detect things, uh, but we would have to do a lot of transmission. And on the other hand, something that's important to us um, sometimes people don't only have one sensor, but many of them, and there needs to be a solution to do this scalably across a large fleet of sensors that you pot potentially have, even if there's a variation in the content that sensors might need. So I think these are four quite uh, sensible challenges, and we're going to be talking about how to address them. Yeah, so this is where basically Sasha and I are working together. How do we build a system that addresses these challenges? And we have two key ideas in this regard a unified format for security content and a unified delivery path. So basically the insight is to decouple the expression of security content from how it's being applied. And this means on the ingress side, there's many different ways to consume um, things, blacklists, uh, rules, regexes, uh, feeds, uh, and so forth. And um, they all need to be applied differently based on how they act um, for Suricata, it's rules and data sets, but other detection tools may have uh, different ways of uh, using and being potentially used, or you're wanting to use the different uh, security content. So ideally, we have a common standardized carrier format. But it's not just about the format, it's also about the transport path of the security. We, um, there's, there's various different channels that security content is being distributed across. Um, and it's not always easy um, to, to get the latest version. Ideally, we have everything fine-grained, and as soon as things are there, we, um, we can make it act, that security content be live and operationalizable, um, and, and avoid bug transfers that delay time to detection. And so this, this from a, from a push-pull perspective, that's, we really want that real-time content publishing um, and a, a quick 
inst instrumentalization as opposed to um, yeah, that other alternative periodic pooling. And what really fits well here is the an established architecture for this, which is publish subscribe. So we built a system for this, and at Tensia we called it Threat, Threat Bus. It has that standardized control plane. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel here. Styx is uh, the de facto standard for expressing variety of security content, and that is the format that runs uh, the way we express internally in Threadbus security content. It's a plugin-based architecture, and uh, it has this concept of a backbone. So um, we're recording this talk, otherwise I would ask everybody like, who's using Kafka in their sock? <laughs> and I'll probably get a head count. Um, same thing for RabbitMQ. It's like there's typically a message broker in a larger um, sock that um, powers and connects different tools. And the idea is that Threadbus piggybacks on that one, jumps on that, and puts that sticks layer on top to um, to make uh, security content actionable. And there's different apps um, that represent these connectors. Obviously, one for Suricata. And for threat intelligence platforms, tips uh, we have for MISP and currently OpenCTI. The communication goes through the bus, and it's typically topic-based subscription. Threadbus also has this feature of snapshots when, say, the Suricata node crashes and it wants to get uh, another um, update from the latest um, version of everything, but up to a certain point in time, say, the last 30 days of everything. And then... Um, and then uh, that's what uh, is a possible request. And uh, it can basically, if somebody can, who crashes on the bus can be uh, refueled quickly. And, and the benefits here, it's displayed on the right. Um, we are moving away from a point-to-point -point API based plumbing architecture to a bus architecture. And it's reducing the number of connections between the tools and standardizing them as well. Um, the, this quadratic overhead uh, goes down to a linear overhead in terms of integration effort, uh, which is especially important as a service provider. And one difference maybe here, this probably looks familiar to OpenDXL. The difference here is that the backbone is configurable and um, not everybody runs MQTT in their SOC. Um, the, here we, with, with Threadbus, we're trying to be as modular as possible and um, yeah, give, give a choice at um, every piece of, uh, of the stack. Okay, next we'll look at two use cases for operationalizing thread data with this uh, system. And the first one is forward matching. And what, what we mean by this, uh, that is that we're looking uh, to find instances of the security content um, after we've deployed it at Suricata. It's the standard mode of operation. Um, and here, each point represents an event such as a Suricata flow, HTTP, and so forth. And we, um, the scenario that's depicted here is um, there's a new indicator that you get from somewhere. Um, it arrives in your tip. And the next job of, of your tooling is to make it act, make it get it out there to your Suricata instances, maybe also to your endpoint, other detection tools, but distribute it, disseminate it so that it can do its job um, at the data source. And so, um, yeah, unless you do something, um, you have the indicator in your tip and nothing happens um, and you're missing future instances. So um, you cannot, I mean, obviously by definition with forward matching, you cannot go back uh, and, and see things that already happened relating to that indicator, but um, you could, in principle, once you have it, move forward. And that, like from an operational perspective, there's this deployment latency. That's basically the time of your tooling that it takes for the indicator to arrive at Suricata and uh, including the real reload and, and everything. So. Um, that during that time, you're technically not able to operationalize the IOC. And you, you still have 
misses. And the goal is really to, to minimize that time. Basically, how do we, how can we do this? And like, basically that's, Sasha described it earlier, the challenges. If you, if you get periodic pulling one it's an hour of, of certain feeds, that's, it's the opposite model we, um, that, that, are, that sets a lower bound on this uh, deployment latency. And so um, that, that's basically what we're designing the system for, to be minimal with respect to deployment latency. And so how does it look like? Um, we'll, we'll look at now at the evolution of the DCSO architecture for forward matching. And what we see right now is here in the headquarter and the, the top, there's uh, the security content is managed centrally. There's a MISP instance um, that is that, that you that base DCSO is using to connect to other um, befriended entities and uh, automatically receive IOCs. And there's also the their own uh, threat intelligence engine, the tie. Uh, that also produces in-house um, security content. And, and these IOCs are um, packaged up um, and put into a Bloom filter currently. That Bloom filter is the summary um, of all the IOCs and it, uh, the sensor picks it up periodically. And Fever is capable of using these Bloom, Bloom filters for inline matching of anything that comes out of Suricata and EVE downstream. And it finds the right fields of the right events where it needs to match and applies these domains, um, IPs, and et cetera, um, and, and basically generates an alert um, once, it, um, once it finds something in the metadata. So the alerts, obviously, they already go through syslog, but then fever escalates every regular event, such as a as a flow or SMB message also into the alert format, and then it arrives, um, goes back to uh, Revit and queue. That's the, that's the old um, architecture and that has the deficiency that this happens uh, periodically. And now basically the, the newer version uh, uses ThreadBus and there's no more um, bulk building of, of data. It's, it's really um, publishing the security content as you go to the backbone, which is Revit and queue for DCSO, and then on the other end at the sensor, they are basically fed piecemeal one by one uh, into fever where the, the bloom filter is still used as a mechanism for matching, but it's being um, built internally and fed uh, at a granular level. And, and that one basically, um, we're now going from pulling say once an hour to uh, real time publishing of uh, security can content. And as soon as it's available, uh, it, it just takes a matter of seconds to propagate uh, and be ready for detection. Right. Thanks, Matthias. Um, I will be moving on to showing this live um, right now. So I am going to be switching to uh, our demo VM now. Okay. So um, I've just switched over to a VM used for demo purposes here, and that contains uh, the whole setup that you were, you've been looking at in the previous slide. Um, we have a MISP instance that run, that's running a Docker container. Uh, we have a Suricata setup, Fever, we have Threadbus, and we also have something called Evebox um, that allows us to view the alerts as they, as they come in. Um, so basically, it's a simplified uh, version of what we've just been describing. Um, and I'm going to take you through the process of uh, adding an additional indicator in MISP and watching alerts uh, getting generated for a PCAP that we uh, replay against our local Suricata instance. So um, let's just quickly begin with verifying that we don't really have, oops, uh, that we don't really have a Suricata rule loaded. As you can see, the rule set is completely empty. And all I'm doing here right now is uh, in this example event, I'm going to add an additional attribute. And let's just use a domain for that purpose. So let's just um, add an additional domain attribute. And let's use this very suspicious one uh, just to, to try this. And let's activate export to the IDS. And once I submit this, you see this one's just been added. And uh, we can see that it has made its way through Threadbus all the way to the, um, to the Suricata machine, uh, where we have received 
an, a, a pattern in, in STIX format that allows the detection, and this has now been added to Fever. So let's just replay um, a PCAP that should trigger one of these uh, alerts here that, that are based on this uh, newly added indicator. And looking at Ifbox, we can hopefully verify that we've seen a new alert. Now, if, if we look at this in more detail, we can see that it looks completely like any other Suricata um, Eve JSON output. Um, with the exception that it's got an additional field here that repeats the original indicator that's that's kind of useful for, for downstream processing. Okay, I'm going to switch back to the slides now to continue with the presentation. Right, so we've looked at the problem where we are going to match on future events. We've, we've dealt with the problem of how to quickly distribute a new indicator to a sensor set. But this talk was titled uh, Detecting Threats Across Past, Present, and Future, right? So we need to talk about the past part here. So um, um, a situation that we can find is that um, once a particular uh, indicator for an infection um, has been seen, it might have been too late already. So there have been situations where attackers have been able to stay under the defender's radar for months. So if we learn about the indicator, um, there might not be a second instance of uh, observing it on the network uh, again, right? Um, we might just have missed the opportunity to detect it. And um, th this situation is completely impossible to deal with with using forward matching only. We actually need to um, uh, address this another way, right? So even if we get the indicator as quickly as possible after we've learned it, there's no way of getting this one again. Uh, that's somewhere in the, in the past. So what we actually need to address this problem is we need to have to get some coverage into the past. We need to have some kind of data store that would allow us to quickly match indicators in past events and ideally for as long as a time as possible to uh, be able to detect infections that might be months ago. Um, so let's just talk about what this actually means, right? Um, and what we want to achieve. Um, any kind of alerts that retro matches like this produce should be completely identical to alerts that um, have been, um, that, that come from live matching or from, from Suricata rules, right? So we also want to have Eve JSON in here, which we probably would need to extend a little bit to um, allow for, for um, this particular situation. Um, also, we want to have these kinds of, uh, of runs to be triggered automatically. So we don't want analysts to, you know, walk through a list of new indicators and then search for them manually uh, one by one. We want to do this the same way we do for, for uh, live matches, right? So even the same way that we enable new indicators to be matched, we also want to trigger backward searches and create alerts if we find anything. And this problem has also been addressed using Threadbus the same way we would, we would do with live matching. So whatever data store we, we want to use, it would need to be able to cope with a potentially large set of new indicators that come in. And that would mean a lot of queries that would run against this data store at the same time um, and look for, well, potentially very um, uh, diverse data that we might throw at it. So those of you who have been here two years ago uh, in 2019 might have seen Matthias' talk about VAST, which is the data store that we are going to use here which is basically um, a system that is specifically designed to store network telemetry um, in the way that Suricata generates and allows very fast and flexible queries against those. So um, VAST is going to be used uh, in, the, in the architecture I'm going to present next. Um, and one another thing that is pretty um, interesting to know and that is actually quite crucial here is that we want to ensure that that the coverage we get into the past is as long as possible and we are currently working on a compaction feature that would allow us to um, automatically migrate not not too important data away from the database or to to modify the structure of data in the database to to lose resolution um, at, uh, with, for the added benefit of being able to looking back further uh, and that, that's a compaction feature that's going to be um, in vast pretty soon Right, so extending the previously shown architecture to include um, the backward matching feature, let's just see what's new here, right? So on the left-hand side, we can see the structure that uh, Matthias has just shown for live matching, but we are adding an additional component on the right-hand side. Um, we've got a processor now that contains the vast data store, 
and that receives copies of all the events that syslog ng generates. So it's not just the alerts, it's basically anything that Zurichata produces, all the metadata that it's able to pass from the observed uh, net -net network traffic. Um, and Vast is coupled with another Threadbus client, with another piece of software that's connected to, uh, to, to the RabbitMQ to receive indicators as they arrive um, from the tip. And it will trigger a search against Vast um, with these indicators. And for whatever match we get, we would uh, pass it on to Fever, which would then um, package it up into an alert that's identical to a regular Bloom filter alert to forward back into this, um, the, the same path that is being used for all the other alerts to be processed by the context engine, so to undergo enrichment, filtering, and so on, and then finally to be written into CM. And um, just to show how that would look like in practice, I'm just going to switch back to the VM for another demo. Okay, so now here in the VM, we're just going to add an additional attribute now, so an additional um, indicator that we've just learned of, and um, this might be just a pretty random one. Let's just add this one here, which is also a domain name that we want to search for. Um, and let's just imagine that we've uh, already uh, seen this indicator in the past. Could be that it might have been in the set of PCAPs that I've just replayed in the previous demo, right? So um, I'm not going to do the replay again, but I'm going to show that um, just by adding this additional indicator here, we've already triggered a background um, uh, background matching process that have, has given us alerts. So let's just take a quick look at the result, uh, the log file of, uh, of the um, a thread bus consumer on the vast machine. And you can see that it has just received um, an additional indicator right here inside a sticks pattern. It has produced a sighting from, uh, from querying vast and has then has emitted an alert. And if we look into Evebox, we should in fact see retro match alerts for exactly that indicator I've just added. And if we look at the structure of those, um, we can see they still look like regular um, Suricata alerts, but here we can see that we have differing timestamps between the time that the match was actually done and the event itself. So that was the original, so the timestamp of the original event that caused uh, this, this alert. So we still we now have a, a means of separating the time of detection from the time the event actually took place that we've been alerting on. I'm now going to switch back to the uh, talk to have Matthias continue with the slides. Okay, so what we've now seen is basically forward matching and backward matching. Um, if we put the two together, we get full coverage on the time axis, meaning as soon as we receive an indicator from somewhere, we automatically are protected from um, seeing it in the future, and we can go back in time with that in same indicator instantly, automatically, and uh, cover all instances. So this is basically what we mean with uh, um, with uh, past, present, and future. The slide uh, sums it up. This uh, the nice thing is that this is fully automated, and um, it's it's now decoupled, the detection process is now decoupled from the arrival of the security content. So to sum up the entire talk, we went through the challenges of operationalizing security content with Suricata. We proposed a solution for two use cases, forward and backward matching, and everything we've shown here today is available as free software. Um, one a few words about Tenzir. Um, the reason why we're here at this talk is so that we, we can have a final uh, a quick summary about what we're doing. If you like this sort of uh, SOC tooling, um, that's where we can help. Operationalizing threat intelligence and enabling advanced detections is uh, basically what we're building, an open core um, platform vast. That's our uh, bedrock product. And it can be also extended with commercial plugins, uh, especially um, for IOC matching. If you are uh, not using Fever or want to apply this architecture uh, beyond the Ricarda data, 
Um, along with it is comes another plugin for passive inventorization, uh, again across uh, endpoint and network telemetry. And uh, yeah, we are um, going to target here retention spans in the um, beyond 12 months with a, a compaction plugin. Uh, there's also other formats, really high speed NetFlow. Um, if uh, basically you want to get instant um, visibility and uh, in a already instrumented environment. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, we have a few more topics actually coming up as uh, here together in a collaboration of DCSO and Tensia. And uh, one thing is uh, generalizing the uh, threat bus data format. Currently, we use six SDOs, the indicator SDO, and also the citing SRO. Um, this is a bit limited. It's actually nicer if we can use um, the SCOs. The SCOs um, are typed and they give us more structure. Mm. The, it allows us to also generate more powerful rules, stateful rules. Um, here, temporal logic example, a lookup first, say, of a specific DNS server followed by a HTTP get. We are also looking um, at, at ex exposing these um, suricata rules for other consumers at a topic on the bus. So, for example, subscribe to sticks to slash indicator slash suricata gives you all the suricata rules. Uh, basically, um, what that would mean um, if we're looking at the pattern type of the indicator SDO, which is an open vocabulary type, um, we would yeah would look for that type here at suricata. And uh, something that's really interesting is, is seeing if we can go beyond uh, just rules, um, use basically the, the security content if uh, where it fits into, say, generic rules using data sets uh, or even like configuration updates. Um, some of the detections are only as powerful as uh, you basically have configured your Suricata to, um, to be, uh, for example, dynamically reconfiguring some of the um, the uh, SMTP servers or SQL servers, uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a topic we're exploring as part of uh, building out the uh, Suricata connector for Threadbus. So one more topic, like I just talked about this in a, briefly, SCOs versus SDO, SDOs. That's a bit future work. S those who are into sticks um, probably have come across this. On the top, we see a um, stick cyber observable, an SCO, and at the bottom, a um, sticks um, and yeah, and the main object, an SDO indicator here. And uh, what we can see is at the bottom, there's this pattern, which is a sticks pattern. Uh, and the pattern types is sticks. If it was suricata, then the pattern type would not be sticks, but, but suricata, and then pattern, the string in there would look differently. So an indicator is kind of a polymorphic object that requires a lot of parsing and, and potentially we may not even understand the pattern that's inside if the pattern type is unbeknownst to us. And, and that's where SCOs are far more deterministic when it comes to expressing security content. The type of the SCO here in the, the top is domain name. So we know this is a domain name. And uh, there's IP addresses, there's new texts, there's all sorts of SCOs. And they typically are connected in a graph in a sticks bundle. So that um, some security content providers provide these sticks bundles. And that's something we would love to, to leverage. That's also that structural relationships between the SCOs. Uh, translating them into stateful rules is, is precisely what we're working on next. And um, yeah, that, that um, if you have ideas on this topic or like to participate, um, we're, um, we'd love to hear from you. That's it. Thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And um, looking for if you if you want to reach out uh, to us. Um, we're both on GitHub on the projects um, or through other means that uh, social media, you'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll find us.